Okay, thanks, Sadiq. Uh, I'd like to thank Pain Talks for allowing me to present this information. I have been in academic medicine for almost 25 years now. I've been fortunate to have trained almost 100 or a little bit over 100 pain medicine fellows uh, at the institution at Texas Tech and probably about 400 residents. And I spend a lot of time at my institution nationally and internationally teaching at various events. Uh, my passion is spreading our knowledge of pain medicine and teaching young folks. So, and sometimes old folks, and I learn from them as well. I think what is important to me, and hopefully I can instill that in you all, is that it would be important if you have, if you're established in your practice and there is a young physician who wants to learn our practice of interventional pain medicine to take them under your wing, uh, to educate them and to help them along because the world needs more pain management physicians because there definitely is a paucity of us. And uh, I think that's something very important to me and hopefully to y'all as well. Let me get, all right. So I do not have any disclosures. Um, our objectives for today are to assess the pain educational systems. Uh, we're gonna have a brief review of educational strategies uh, for studying for interventional pain exams. We'll look at um, study aids that are available, not only uh, books and websites, but uh, other uh, forms of education. And then I'm going to list some pearls uh, that I have put together over the last many years training folks that hopefully will assist y'all as you progress along uh, in getting educated in pain medicine. Now I'm gonna look at the United States first because the US is very, very well established when it comes to educational systems for pain medicine and uh, interventions. I mean, through the American College of Graduate Medical Education and through the different subspecialties or the specialties that pain medicine involves like the American Board of Anesthesiology, the American Board of Physical Medicine Rehabilitation, American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, and the American Board of Family Practice. So these are the boards where if you complete an ACGME accredited fellowship, which we have about 111 of them since, um, and this is updated since 2021, and these vary a little bit every year. And our fellowships are one year in length and they can vary from minimally interventional to highly interventional. So there is a nice variety of interventional uh, fellowships. And if you have somebody who's not really interested in intervention, but still wants to do a fellowship, then there's the ability to look at the different um, programs and apply to the ones that you um, uh, feel comfortable applying to. There are approximately 380 fellowship positions. So every year, uh, 380 fellowships uh, fellows can take the subspecialty certification in pain medicine. And as Dr. Rotz would say, if they achieve a passing score, then they can be uh, have their subspecialty certification in pain medicine. So this is what the majority of uh, fellows do in the U.S. Now, there are some institutions uh, there are fellows who may not match because there's always twice as many fellows uh, or fellow applicants as there are fellowship positions. So some of them may take uh, what we call unaccredited fellowships that are about a year in length and they're modeled similarly after the ACGME accredited fellowships. But after they complete these fellowships, they cannot take the subspecialty certification test in pain medicine. And that particular exam that we have is uh, just a uh, um, test. It's on a testing system, so it's a written test. There is no cadaver uh, examination. There's no oral examination when it comes to pain medicine. So, but then the graduates of these unaccredited fellowships do look for uh, accreditation, and one of the tests or the exams they can take is the Fellow of Interventional Pain Practice from the WIP. So, some of them go this direction. There's additional education, um, as um, Sadiq was putting up there. There's plenty of 
societies who put on uh, fellowship or um, lectures and cadaver, cadaver courses like through ASIP, um, the World Institute of Pain, which I'm involved. Sadiq showed you a picture of the Orlando meeting that we will have in April of next year, which I'm one of the program coordinators. And uh, this is a, a great way to uh, meet internationally recognized pain medicine physicians. I spend probably two or three weekends in Budapest every year as well with Pain School International. So there are many, many additional educational opportunities that can be um, done to help um, improve our skills. Uh, I can tell you I'm pretty darn good using a fluoroscope when it comes to ultrasound. I'm kind of so-so. Um, maybe in the next 15 years before I retire, maybe I'll, I'll get better at that. So I know Sadiq is really good at that. Uh, and some of y'all are too. And sometimes I learn from my students. Um, board certification, like I said, there's um, several institutions in the United States where you can get board certification. Uh, in the U.S., the only other interventional pain exam that I know of that has cadaver portion is the American side of interventional pain physicians through the American Board of Interventional Pain uh, Physicians. So the rest of them, uh, like I said, except for the WIP, there's no cadaver exam. It's purely a written exam. And I was asking Sadiq uh, a little bit yesterday whether or not there's any other exams he knows of that involves a cadaver. And he said there weren't. So this is kind of a unique thing, which I think is really important um, that uh, these exams, and I'll go over the FIPP exam because it's, since it's the most well-known uh, exam uh, at the latter part of this talk. Um, the rest of the world. So what I did um, a couple of years ago in order to get some understanding of the educational opportunities in the rest of the world, uh, I went through the World Institute of Pain, and as Sadiq was saying, you know, the WIP was established in 93 by five physicians, two of which he mentioned, Prithvi Raj and Gabor Ratz, who were my mentors. But then there was David Niv in Israel, uh, Sardar Erdene in Turkey, and Ricardo Ruiz Lopez. Um, they formed the World Institute of Pain because what they saw um, globally at this time that there was just, except for probably the International Association for the Study of Pain, the ISP, there wasn't a society that focused on teaching physicians the interventional aspect of pain medicine. Um, I mean, this inter interventions are really important because it's a part of that interdis <clears throat> interdisciplinary approach or the multimodal approach, which we all know uh, with physical therapy, with uh, medications uh, and um, psychiatric stuff and interventions that the three of them working together, you're better able to treat a patient than either one alone. So interventions were important. And like I said, the United States and uh, some of the first world countries were very fortunate that they had um, the ability to do some of these procedures, but the rest of the world didn't. So I looked at the 26 sections of the World Institute of Pain. I uh, uh, inquired about the established curriculum, pain fellowships, subspecialty recognition and exam certification. And here are the different sections. There's a, a new one coming up from the Indonesians um, because you can have a subsection if I believe you have 20 FIPPs in your country and that's enough to establish a, a new section for the World Institute of Pain. So I queried the, the section heads of the WIP. I had 17 that responded that you can see here. And so I garnered this information off of what they provided me. And I updated this uh, a little bit last year and a little bit this year. Now, as far as established curriculum, what I found was that the majority of sections that reported that an established pain medicine curriculum did not exist. Uh, Turkey, the UK, Greece, Canada, Ireland, the Netherlands, Israel, uh, Korea, and the New Zealand, New Zealand, Australia had established pain management curriculum. So at least in these countries, there was, there was pen to paper, that curriculum was established um, that could be used to educate physicians. But as you can see, the majority of the rest of the world does not have this. Um, the majority of the sections reported that a formal pain management fellowship did not exist. Uh, there were some, uh, some of the countries had an extra three to six months to a year of additional training devoted to pain. Some of this was acute, some of this was pharmacological, some was palliative, 
some was cancer and some was interventional. Uh, one of my colleagues from the UK, uh, Patrick McGowan, I think Sadiq knows Patrick probably. Patrick actually came to the United States when I was a anesthesia resident and was a visiting professor. So while he was there in the two years, he spent a lot of time over in the uh, pain clinic with Dr. Rotz and Dr. Raj learning how to do interventional pain. So he was fortunate to be able to, to, to do that. Um, uh, once again, Turkey, Iran, Canada, Colombia, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Ireland, Korea, and the UK have formal pain management fellowships from what I had garnered. So once again, the rest of the world does not have um, pain management fellowships. As far as subspecialty recognition, the majority of sections report that few countries have recognition. Uh, Sadiq, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the UK does. Um, if you, can, um, if you can see, once again, the countries that typically had curriculum and fellowship positions also have subspecialty recognition and pain. And so you can see, once again, the rest of the world is lacking. Um, exam certification, um, once again, that's the same. Uh, um, you can see that the majority of sections do not have pain medicine certification, it doesn't exist. And so that's where the, the FIPP exam for the World Institute of Pain comes into play because in the countries that do not have formal pain education, uh, the fellow of interventional pain practice serves as uh, kind of board certification and prestige in certain countries. So that's why I spent a lot of my time uh, educating those across the globe. I mean, I always tell my fellows that I have two fellows, sometimes three every year that rotate with me and some private practice colleagues who I've trained. And anytime they somewhat complain about something, I tell them, you know, you have nothing to complain about because the rest of the world just does not have what we have uh, as far as education. So this is kind of my passion is to spread the world. And I think this year I have eight or nine overseas trips where I'll be educating uh, physicians. And of course, then my, my regular job of teaching fellows in the U.S. Now, what were some reported difficulties in some countries they had a very difficult time getting cadavers. Uh, I know in Brazil and Israel, and I think in Egypt, there were some religious, you know, um, reasons outside of medical school, you can't get cadavers. Um, a lot of places had, excuse me, had to import cadavers um, and there wasn't any formal training. So uh, education outside of, you know, your home country can get expensive uh, having to spend, I mean, we in the United States and, and first world countries, we kind of take for granted what we get paid um, for doing for being a physician and doing our, our trade, our practice. But in some countries, what, you know, the, the, the exam costs is what they make in a month or, you know, so it is very expensive when there's no formal training. Um, so we try to be able, I think one of the goals eventually of the World Institute of Pain is to take the training to countries uh, instead of having folks come to us at our three or four meetings every year, or even having to travel to other meetings from, you know, that other societies put on, it just gets pretty expensive. Now, I'm going to talk about the FIPP exam, um, because as I was um, speaking, it and the one given by the American Board of Individual Pain Physicians <clears throat> are the only examinations where a cadaveric portion is involved. Now, the FIP exam purpose uh, was to establish knowledge domain of the practice of pain medicine for certification. Uh, we wanted to assess the knowledge of interventional techniques of pain medicine physicians in a psychometrically valid manner. So this exam <clears throat> is vetted. It had, we had a psychometrician who looked at our questions, who looked at our methods, who looked at our grading, um, to make sure that it was appropriate and valid. What we wanted to encourage was professional growth in the practice of interventional techniques. Um, I always say that we learn from everybody. We learn from our mentors. We learn from our students. Um, we learn, well, geez, we learn from our parents. Um, and I joke that if you ever stop learning, then you should retire because we can all fine tune our techniques in our thought processes when it comes to interventional um, pain medicine. We also wanted to recognize formally 
individuals who meet requirements set forth by the World Institute of Pain Board of Examination. So, you know, getting the FIPP was is very important, and we always recognize those um, uh, physicians who achieved a passing score at a big um, presentation uh, at some of our various meetings. So it's a big, big to do. And we also wanted to serve the public by encouraging quality patient care in the practice of pain medicine. Um, in the United States, there has been a move of physicians who weren't formally trained in pain medicine to take weekend courses and then go out and practice interventional pain medicine without actually ever really, you know, placing a needle in a live patient or for the or not even injecting contrast for you know the epidurals or other procedures that we do. So we wanted to make sure that the public was safe um, because we can't just let we don't just want to let any physician with a little bit of knowledge practicing our trade and I hate to say it this way, but making a bad name for interventional pain medicine um, in the U.S. There is a uh, a governmental body called the Office of Inspector General which looks at practices across um, all areas. And one of the things I saw about 10 years ago was a significant increase in the uh, performance of medial branch blocks and medial branch radio frequency. So they did um, an investigation globally and actually decreased our reimbursement. They looked at different specialties of physicians who were performing this procedure and showed that family medicine physicians and internal medicine physicians who are practicing pain had the highest number of errors with billing and documentation. So it just shows us that there are physicians that don't take our specialty. Uh, they take it for granted. Uh, they're not practicing proper pain medicine, and that can affect a, a lot of things down the road. So it is really important to uh, encourage quality of care, not quantity. Quality is more important than quantity. Now, the FIP examination has three components. Um, there is a the theoretical examination, which is the first part. The second part is a practical examination where uh, there are four cadaver procedures, and I will go over each part of these. There's an oral examination where you have two clinical vignettes, and there are two examiners. Um, part one is machines scored, and parts two and three are scored by trained examiners. So What's important for y'all to know is that the examiners, we always have an examiner's orientation uh, before uh, each of the examination to go over the do's and the don'ts of, of giving the exam. Um, the examiners, we have observer examine, examiners who are not part of the examination process yet, but want to become part of it. So they have to uh, participate by being essentially the third wheel and part of the examination to see how senior examiners perform the examination. So uh, we teachers um, are also, we, we, have, we have to be vetted as well. Um, I have certificate number 10 and the first top, the first 10 or 12 examiners, we actually had to, we examined each other. So I was not just given a certificate to say you're FIPP number 10, I had to actually do the examination. So uh, just to let y'all know that I didn't get the, I didn't have the easy way out in the beginning. Now, the, the scoring is real important because the cadaveric portion of it, the practical portion of it is 60%, 60%, so more than half. The theoretical is 10% and the oral is 30%. So the WIP puts a huge emphasis on the cadaveric portion of this because we want to see what you can do. Um, taking a test on a book and from a you know, book test, you know, the, the theoretical portion, you can know, you can know the indications, you can know the procedure, the complications. But if you're not good at performing the procedure, we, we get a little bit worried because that's kind of dangerous. Um, it's a disservice. Um, to your patients. You could harm the patient. So patient safety is so key uh, when it comes to performing our, you know, performing these procedures and performing this examination. Now, this is kind of a pyramid of learning um, taken from Edgar Dale, the cone of learning. And as you can see, um, after two weeks, we tend to remember only 10% of what we read. 
um, you know, you've, you've gone through exams, you've gone through your tests and you read and read and read, but you retain only part of it. We retain 20% of what we hear. So discussions, we retain 30% of what we see. And as you can see, as you go down this cone, that we retain 90% of what we both say and do by doing a dramatic presentation, by simulating the real experience and by doing the real thing. So the active process of doing, you know, doing the cadaver portions, practicing the oral examinations, that is the best way to actively learn something. And so you can see, and this is very well published in the um, education literature. So seeing and doing are really important. And having a senior examiner, a senior faculty guide you, uh, correct subtle little things, sometimes big things, but that's the key thing. And it's in, like I said, I learn from my students as well. I, I know I don't know everything. I promise you that. My wife says I think I do, but um, I know I don't. Um, but it's important for me to learn as well because it helps me as an educator learn if I'm doing, if I'm educating folk, uh, other physicians properly. Uh, I can sit there and keep doing the same thing over and over. But if, if I am not getting through to my students, then I am doing a disservice to my students and I need to do better. So that's real key. And that's just kind of a circle showing the bottom of the important stuff. So part one, like I said, is a uh, multiple choice questions that you have two hours to do. The study aids I recommend. Um, this interventional pain book, um, as you can see, it's a step-by-step -step guide for the FIP exam. So this goes over all the procedures, all the interventional procedures. Uh, for anatomy indications and so on and so forth. So it's a very good study aid. Um, I've contributed to it. I get no money from it. Um, the complication portion, this book that was put out by Dr. Erdne at Stats is real important because I think the, uh, one of the things, you know, as you're doing procedures um, in a cadaver lab is we can never inject contrast. So we can never talk about contrast patterns. And those are so very important when you're injecting contrast to make sure you're in the right tissue plane to make sure you're not in a blood vessel. Or if you're in a blood vessel, you can identify whether it is a vein or an artery, because of course, arteries is not where we want to be. Unless you're doing a transaortic celiac plexus, we want to stay out of the big, the big red vessels. Okay. Um, other study aids, Furman, I've been told is a real good book for radiographic imaging and learning the, the imaging, the looking at the images, because that's very key. And I'll talk about a little bit about that in, in a couple of minutes. And this is a board review self-assessment uh, for interventional pain. I don't have any money coming out of this. This one actually is uh, published by ASIP, as you can see, Manchikanti, Andrea Trescott, good friend of ours, uh, Frank Falco, so unfortunately went to heaven uh, last year, and then Paul Christo. Um, as well. So lots of websites. Um, I think the one thing that a lot of um, this is a good one to look at is the ABA because it's actually the, the curriculum that I have to teach my fellows and you can see all the different parts of it, but it's not specific, specific to interventional pain. It's for the whole fellowship, um, but it's a good, good thing to, to look at. So lots of websites. Now, part two, which is actually comes after the cadaveric portion is you have two vignettes. So you have two examiners and there's 15 minutes for each one of these vignettes. And basically you can see what we're focusing on because these are all the, as you assess the patient, you're, you're given a STEM question. And from the STEM question, you have to garner the differential diagnosis you have to determine whether you need additional diagnostic tests. Um, you need to know the conservative treatments, the interventional techniques. And then once we get to the interventional techniques, because this is the important part of this, um, what we look at is the information you provide to the patient before you proceed for the, to the injection. And then you have to describe the procedure, complications, post-procedure care and anatomy. We know we do things every day for our patients. We know we do the procedure, we fill out paperwork, we click a bunch of buttons since a lot of it's electronic health records, at least for us in the United States. But we, but sometimes it's difficult to verbalize it because we just do, do, do. You really don't think about what you do, but then when you have to verbalize it, sometimes you kind of get stuck. It's like, okay, what did I tell this patient? 
Um, what I typically do for during the examinations if I'm the, the examiner, I say, pretend I'm the patient. I want you to tell me exactly what you would tell the patient. I'm the patient. And then it usually makes it easier when I do that to help the um, examinees go through this whole procedure um, the process. And these are the list of the different procedures that uh, we take the clinical vignettes from. So there's, as you can see, there's quite a bit. I don't know beforehand which questions are going to be asked. Uh, that is something that the, um, the WIP has the examination board, which is headed by Chris Vissers and Monique Stegers is the registrar. So we have a board that, that analyzes this every year uh, to make sure that we are doing the right thing. And what we're trying to do or the, the examination board is to eventually put the theoretical portion online to where you can do that online beforehand. And we can do the clinical vignettes via Zoom, like we're lecturing today. And then the cadaveric portion, of course, has to be in person. So we're trying to, or the exa examination board is trying to continuously update this to make it easier, um, perhaps kind of a traveling exam. If there's a country that has 20 physicians who want to take the FIPP exam, then we can come to you. Um, which makes it, well, less expensive, you know, for the examinee because they don't have to travel, but it's constantly being updated. So we're not stuck, you know, back in 2000 when this exam first came around. So we're trying to advance it to make it easier for folks, uh, especially in those areas that, like I said earlier, that, you know, the their monthly salary is, the, is what the exam costs. Um, some of the pearls that I've come up with for the oral exam is, please answer the question asked. Um, sometimes there's a communication barrier. Um, so far, we have provided this examination in Spanish and in Portuguese um, and, of course, English. Hopefully, over time, we can get this changed up a bit. I'm, I don't know if we have an exam in Taiwan every year, whether or not Taiwanese is, um, is used during the exam. That I don't know, but I'll find out. If you get flustered, take a break. <laughs> breathe, uh, take a sip of water, collect your thoughts, and um, proceed with the exam. It, it's it's nerve wracking, um, but um, you know you got to breathe. Now this is the the part um, that is the longest and is worth sixty percent. Essentially, you have to perform four procedures in one hour on a cadaver. Um, it's an average of fifteen minutes procedure in a presence of two examiners. This doesn't mean that you only have 15 minutes to do a procedure. Um, basically, when you apply for the examination, you list your scope of practice about which procedures you do, and then you choose the registrar will choose, I'm trying to find the list, the list. So here's the list. So they will choose one procedure from each of these sections. And then you will receive a grade on uh, the performance of the procedure. What's real important to remember is that please do not apply for the exam unless you can probably do 60 to 70% of all these procedures. Okay. If you can only do a, a cervical facet block, an intercostal nerve block, a lumbar facet block, and an SI joint, because you're, you know the basic procedures and you're good, don't take the exam because that exam would be easy compared to somebody who has to do a trigeminal, who has to do a splanchnic, who has to do a discogram, who has to do a neuroplasty. So make sure, and if you do them, make sure you've done more than one or five. It's got to be part of your practice. I've seen too many examinees um, take the exam who were not, did not have a, a good scope of practice when they took the exam and they did not achieve a passing score. Like I said, it's expensive. And I want, my goal is to, I really want everybody to pass. Just this last exam in Taiwan, 100% passing rate, okay? But I can't just pass you. You've got to have the breadth of knowledge. This I'm just showing because here's Dr. Rotz in his younger years. This is Philip Finch. And this is in Budapest, uh, the exam. And 
of course, the patient is in the prone position. So if you have four procedures and three of them, you can do just like that. Do those first and use the rest of your time to do the more challenging one. And these, this is the SIPS exam. I think, Sadiq, you have the SIPS as well, uh, which is another exam that can be taken through ultrasound. Uh, like I was saying earlier, I'm not gifted too much at ultrasound yet uh, to be able to take this exam maybe in the future. Um, imaging, just some pearls. Uh, when choosing a level um, to do the block, look for the level that has the best anatomy. I'm just using this as an example because you can see if you're going to do a medial branch block that you could, you know, you can see this pedicle better than you can see this pedicle. Part of it is the angle of the C arm, but choose a level that looks almost normal. Um, you know, even we, we know we do most of our medial branch blocks at four, five, five S1, because that's where a lot of the arthropathy is. But when you do the exam and if L12 looks pretty, go to L12, right? Same technique. Um, well, as you're doing the procedure, you know, don't automatically uh, take the picture that the, the fluoroscopist gives you, you know, make sure it's the right picture. If there are three procedures done prone and one supine, do the prone first. And once again, do the easier procedures first. Um, if you can do three procedures in 15 minutes, that means the more difficult one, you've got 45 minutes to do. Um, collect for parallax. I think this is important. We know parallax is where the, there's two overlapping shadows. And I see this mostly on a lateral. So you can see here, you have one side of the vertebral body. Here's one side, you need these to overlap. And this is just a picture from Andre Monsano showing a um, sphenopalatine ganglion block where you see one fissure here. And then on the right picture, you see uh, the two fissures overlap. So make sure you correct for parallax. Keep your hands out of this beam. Uh, one of the things that we focus on is radiation safety, right? Because radiation can affect your skin. Can affect your corneas, you can um, um, affect um, your thyroid. So please keep your hand out of the beam. This is courtesy of a friend of mine who's a pain management physician in Chicago. Sadiq may know him, but I'm not going to say his name. Um, when he put this picture on Facebook, I said, ah, nice picture of your hand. He said, thank you. But keep your hand out of the beam because we grade you on radiation safety as well. Now, this is Uncle Miles' words of wisdom to achieve a passing score. I'm Uncle Miles. Um, let's see, here we go. Know your anatomy. Um, the thing about doing procedures is we know, we see fluoroscopic anatomy. We don't see soft tissue anatomy. So you got to know your anatomy because unfortunately, if you do have a complication, I've had a few, uh, you've got to figure out how you had a complication. And if you don't know your anatomy, then you might have a hard time figuring out what happened. So know your anatomy, just your real anatomy, not just fluoroscopic anatomy. Um, assess the fluoroscopic image before you adjust your needle. Take a look at it, assess it. Don't automatically reach for the needle because it may not be a good picture. I do this to my fellows all the time. Um, is this a good picture? Uh, and then they say, no, I need to do this. It's like, a, well, if it wasn't a good picture, then why, did, why were you about to advance your needle? Uh, oh, so assess the picture. Make sure it's the picture you want. Keep your hands out of the beam. Uh, read the doctor book. Basically, that's read it, whatever book that you have that can help facilitate uh, your knowledge. I mean, there's umpteen textbooks out there. One is not necessarily better than the other. Uh, one fits your learning style better than the other. So, you know, read the doctor book. Treat your cadaver like you would treat your patient. I've seen examinees just jab, 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 jab the needle in a cadaver. And I, I asked them, it's like, would you treat your patients like this? Would you repeatedly do that? If you, and the answer is no, then don't do that to a cadaver. We need to respect the cadaver, respect the dead, you know, that they will that body to help you learn and others learn. So please respect uh, the cadaver. Answer the question, ask, you know, if we ask you a yes or no question, the answer is yes or no. It's not something else, okay? And there are no trick questions. Uh, that would be unfair to ask a trick questions, especially during an exam. And once again, know your anatomy, okay? And so that concludes my presentation. Um, I sure do appreciate everyone here. Uh, looks like we have 33 folks. Yes. And Sadiq, I'll let you take it back. Sure, sure. thank you so much, Matt. That was fantastic. I think... Uh, I like the the last bit that you said, Uncle Miles' tips to pass the. <laughs> <laughs> I think 
uh, guys, if you have any questions, please do put in the in the chat box. Because, uh, Miles, I do have a question. Okay, now question is obviously I've done my FIPP. Uh, now, when you say don't take the exams if you haven't got the broad spectrum of procedures, what mm -hmm. would you advise for people to then improve the spectrum or the clinical practice? Because not everybody, you know, I don't do quarter neuroplasty in my practice. I learned for the exam, but what I did. Right. I so a, a, a physician who was doing that regularly in their practice. So we might have a rheumatologist who might not be doing quadrant neuroplasty. <clears throat> what would be your advice? What would you suggest to kind of, you know, improve their scope of practice or to learn that technique? What can they do? You know, what I, I've, what I've had or sometimes encourage is, is, is you can be a visiting huh? physician, you know, wait, wait, visit a physician who holds that as part of, or does that regularly. I just had a physician visit me from Greece. Uh, she spent two weeks to kind of fine tune. Uh, I actually videotaped a trigeminal for a colleague of mine. Um, I get these requests. You can look for cadaver, um, well, uh, cadaver sessions that teach the procedure you want. But I think visiting physicians who do the procedure goes a long way. Seeing, doing, not just doing on a cadaver because then you see the subtle nuances of each procedure. I know that can get expensive too, but uh, visiting physicians or um, spending a couple of weeks with one of those uh, doctors can can be a benefit. And that's what I've done in the past. And I think uh, you're right. If you go and see a physician who does that day in, day out, not only are you going to see the procedure, you're also mm -hmm. going to see how they consent the patients, what complications are they telling, and how are they assessing before the procedure, especially even for a simple procedure like medial branch block. You know, uh, I like to examine the patient and mark the skin and then, you know, ask them for the pain score, do the procedure and ask them for the pain score after. So you, you can pick up a lot of tips, I gathered. So, right. okay, now we have a next question here. Uh, is there a projection for a board certification or diploma certification in Latin South America in any time in near future? <clears throat> to do something in South America, Miles. I guess that goes to everyone. I mean, not that I know of. You know, I teach in Argentina and Brazil a lot, and they still rely on the FIPP as their certification. Um, that would have to go to, um, you know, the um, I guess the Latin South American section of the WIP to find that out. But at least from what I know, it's not there yet. I don't think Argentina. Mm -hmm. um, has one yet as well. So I think one of the things what we're trying to do, like I said earlier, is if a country has a large number of physicians who want to take the FIPP exam, we're trying to arrange it to where we would go to them. Um, we, you know, the thought is to let them set up, you know, the cadaver portion, we come in, give the exam and leave. So that may help other things. But as far as each of the individual countries, that I do not know. <laughs> Now, next question we have here is uh, that there is a question. What is the best fellowship program in pain medicine in the Middle East recognized in the Gulf countries? And that probably is a question for me from Bilal. So Bilal, <laughs> we, are, we are working on a fellowship uh, program at Cleveland. Uh, and I'm, I'm basically putting a lot of efforts. So inshallah, in the near future, we will have a fellowship in, in the Gulf region. And you will know because we'll be putting that out on the on the social media platforms. Now we have another question here uh, from Dr. Jaya Batra. She's a colleague of mine. She says, do we have to choose the procedures from each section if you are doing some procedures with ultrasound guidance and not fluoroscopy guidance? So is that the rule that we have to kind of, you know, have the procedure from one every region? If, yeah, example, there's still the, again, the Nowadays, yeah, the so yeah, yeah. The the sorry, uh, Sadiq. The procedures are chosen for you, um, based on your scope of practice. And I guess we can talk about stellates. Uh, some do stellate ultrasound, some do stellate fluoroscopy. But if you're doing the FIPP exam, every procedure has to be done fluoroscopically guided. If you're doing the SIPS SIPS exam, then every procedure is done with ultrasound. So there's not no crossover. And so hopefully that answers your question. It, the registrar Monique Steegers is the one that chooses the procedure for you. If there is a section where you do not um, have a big scope of practice, then the procedure may be chosen for you. Um, what we tried to do before all the FIPP exams 
is we have a review course uh, a couple of days beforehand, and then the exam is typically on a Sunday or a Monday. So we go over all the procedures. So if there are some procedures you're not real good at, you have the chance to do them on the cadaver. And yes, there is the, the slight possibility that you may given a, be given a procedure you don't do on a regular basis. But once again, you have to have to do something slightly more challenging uh, during that exam. So outside, hopefully outside the comfort zone and uh, right. at least to know the basic principles and stepwise approach because uh, exactly. this hypogastric uh, plexus block, you know, I don't, I mean, I do pelvic pain, but majority of my stuff is all ultrasound guided pudendal nerve blocks and stuff. So, mm -hmm. but I think uh, I had to learn hypogastric plexus block for the exam because that's something that I definitely want. And I think I still remember the steps. So if I ever had to do, <laughs> I should be able to do it because it's just a stepwise approach. Now you told us the pearls to pass the exam. When would you fail a candidate? Because it will be nice, <laughs> nice to know what are the don't do for the for the exam. You know, um, dangerous well, thing. People must yeah, have. I've seen. It I can before. tell you the one procedure that most examinees are challenged with is a cervical epidural steroid injection. Of all the procedures, failing to get a contralateral oblique or a lateral uh, before entering the epidural space and then getting a lateral and finding out that you're touching the posterior longitudinal ligament and that you've gone through the cord. That would get you the, the examine. The procedures are examined on a, a, a scale of four: one being unacceptable, dangerous; two being unacceptable, not dangerous; three being acceptable, basic competency; and a four is acceptable, uh, you know, the best competency. If you put a needle through the cord, you get a one. That's you good. should have to have an average of at least over. Well, since it's sixty percent of your your score of a three in order to achieve a passing score. So if you get a one, a one, a three, and a three, you're probably not going to pass. Um, so that would be an example of a fail, at least that particular procedure. Um, you can get a one on a procedure and, and three fours and still pass. Um, and you may not have purposely put the needle through the cord, but you forgot a basic step. Um, treating the patient uh, being abusive of the cadaver will fail you 100%. Um, so I always say, even if you don't get a contralateral oblique on a lateral before entering the epidural space for a cervical epidural, please do in the, during the exam <laughs> so that we know. Um, so you would say like doing a driving test, right? You know, if, you know, when you do driving tests, you're going to check the left-hand mirror, right-hand mirror right. indicator, just follow the rules. <laughs> So the examiners know. Now, doing the running commentary, is that necessary when you do the exam? Do you have to speak out whilst you do the procedure? During the procedures, no. You don't have to tell us anything. If you want to do the, the procedure, and the only thing we need to hear is final position. That's how you have to say eight words during the cadaver portion, and that's saying final position four times. If it makes you comfortable saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, fine. You can say that. We have no problem with that. Um, so it's up to you. Sure. That the During the cadaver portion of the exam, the examiners are not allowed to ask you questions at all. Um, that comes during the oral portion. And so there is a monitor during the cadaver portion of the lab, walking around the lab, reminding physicians not to ask questions to the examinees during the exam. So we're we're pretty hardcore when it comes to maintaining the integrity of the exam. And I gather, obviously, I've done I've done a one till a couple two two or three I think three three FIPP exams, and I think to let other guys know that we have a very clear guidance as an examiner that you're not even allowed to show expressions. You just want to keep quiet and kind of you know. And and I think we get told help the delegates. Don't make them nervous put them right. at peace, you know, that's right. Yeah, my, so we just try our best. If somebody's stuck, we'll say, you know, do you want some water? You know, are you okay? And then I think, and if the procedure is not going as planned and if they are basically getting nervous, mm -hmm. we always tell them, you know, take a break, you know, and then try and see if you can do a different procedure and visit that procedure, which was challenging later on, I think. And, but we, we do try our best to, to help the delegates, the, the examinees to actually pass the exam. So I think, but Miles, uh, once again, thank you so much. That was a fantastic talk. And uh, 
uh, I'll probably see you in near future face to face and uh, yes, sir. Have, have a have a great uh, Saturday. You still Saturday. Thanks, Saturday. Okay, take care, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye bye now. Bye. Bye bye.